We're joined now by a beat, for our beat panel discussion by Edmund Graham of the ICSA, Jackie Cahill, Fianna Fáil, uh, Stephen Conroy from ICBF, and Joe Burke from Board Bia. Uh, Joe, if I can start with you, can you give us an update on uh, the markets at the moment uh, the, on the on weekly exports? Okay, so I suppose for the year to date, cattle slaughterings, as in cattle supplies, have been well ahead of last year's levels. In total, the cattle throughput is up by about 42,000 head, or about 3.5%. Um, so the supply is up. On the With regard to carcass weights, though, on average, cattle have been slaughtered at lighter weights, so our actual volume of exports wouldn't be up by as much. We estimate they're probably only up by between 1% and 2%. If we look at the CSO volumes, our exports in terms of markets uh, would be up to the UK. Um, so even in spite of uh, Brexit and the uncertainty around the whole uh, you know, political situation, um, the trade situation is that the UK market has been relatively good and uh, our exports there are up 2%. Um, if we look at the cattle prices, for the year to date, on average, the cattle price would be up slightly on last year's levels. And right now, at the moment, the quotes are identical to this time last year. Um, around Europe, cattle prices would be lower than previous year's levels. And this is as a result of, again, higher numbers of cattle being slaughtered with uh, difficult weather conditions here this year. But this was also the situation, particularly in Northern Europe. So they actually had to cull a lot of their herd uh, and slaughter additional animals earlier than usual. And this has placed uh, pressure on the beef market around Europe. The UK is probably you know, the, the exception at the moment in that the cattle price there has recovered in the last few weeks and actually has uh, increased by up to five pence a week. So in the UK, even currently at the moment, the beef price there for an R-grade steer is equivalent to €4.20 Euro a kilo, excluding VAT at the moment. So it's well ahead of the Irish price. Edmund, uh, what's your response there to, uh, to the markets at the moment? And uh, do you think there's a future for the suckler herd? Uh, it's looking very grim, so it is. Um, the suckler farmers just aren't getting a return for the produce. And I suppose that falls back because the beef farmer can't give enough for the animal in the marts. So uh, the suckler farmer is getting it very tight. And unless they're breeding a real top quality animal, maybe that are suitable for export, the average suckler farmer, no, he can't survive. Jackie, uh, your own party and yourself uh, have campaigned for the €200 Euro per cow uh, payment per suckler cow. Um, do you think that's, that's the answer? Well, it is, one of the, it is one of the components of the answer. Uh, you know, we have a sector that's under extreme pressure. Um, you know, the, that's only the producers of the suckler when and but anyone who's feeding the, 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 the off-push, the, uh, the, the steers or the heifers coming out of the dairy, the dairy herd. Like we have an increasing number of them there. They're suffering seriously under the grid. Like Joe talked about the factory price that's available in England at the moment in the UK. Um, the factories have exploited the situation over the last couple of months. Um, you know, grass is scarce. Farmers are under serious pressure for cash flow. And as soon as we got a, 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 any symptoms of a drought, factory prices dropped immediately. So there's a lot of problems. We have a beef forum that's there, and I called there two weeks ago, that that beef forum should be brought together and find out exactly how much the side of beef is worth. Like on the dairy side, we have prices coming out of our newer, and we can know within a cent what a litre of milk is worth. We can't say for definite what, a, what, what the bullock is worth or what the heifer is worth. And factories are exploiting that situation at the moment. You know, 385 for heifers at the moment, 375 for steers. That's not, uh, that's not a price that anyone can survive on, whether he's a suckler farmer or someone factoring stock out, out of the dairy herd. So, you know, if we don't change and if, if we don't step up to the mark, like the 200 euros of a suckler cow, you know, will help. But we have to get a proper return from the marketplace as well. The father situation, um, the, the dairy side has very much been highlighted, um, the impact on the dairy side. Uh, can you just outline the impact of the fodder shortage on the beef side? I know you yesterday launched, Fianna Fáil launched um, an action plan on that. I think what brings it home to, to Roos most is I the people coming into my clinics who are beef farmers and they can't get any credit facilities from their banks from the financial institutions. Like Bank of Ireland announced there a couple of weeks ago that we're putting an extra 100 million into, into, into ag agricultural finance. But the people who need it most, um, beef farmers, who have high merchant bills built up after an extremely hard spring, and an, the, I suppose the roughest summer that we can remember as regards grass growth, 
they're just been refused credit facilities. And the banks will say, you know, they haven't got the repayment capacity. But something has to be done for them men. They have to be able to clear their merchant, their merchant credit. And, you know, a hardship fund has to be brought into place for them. It's that been an extremely costly year. One of the worst, longest winters we can, we can ever rem remember. And as, as summer that we actually grew very, very little grass. So, you know, those, we need a hardship fund. Those people need to be able to clear their merchant debt and, you know, be able, to, be, able, be able to farm on. And to leave it to the banks, the minister is reneging on his responsibility because those that need it most, the banks will refuse. Stephen, just on the concerns that outlined for the entire sector, there, there's a broad, broad amount of concerns. On, for the suckler in particular, do you think that breeding um, can go some way to improving the situation for suckler farmers? Yeah, certainly. I think in terms of uh, one of the schemes that was launched a number of years ago, the BDGP, the Beef Data Genomics Programme, if you look at that, what that has delivered to the, the just under 25,000 herds that are participating in that, our, our calving interval in our cows, which was, was going in the wrong direction, has gone from 2014, 404 days, to currently in 2018, uh, 393 days. So we've made an 11 day turnaround in that, which has been huge. And that's really been on back on uh, breeding decisions made, uh, new bulls being used, but also culling decisions within the herd. Um, also in that cows per calf per year, which is a, a big factor in terms of economics for the farmer, has gone from 0.81 in 2014 to 0.87 uh, uh, this year. So that's that's been a huge improvement. And I suppose there's a lot of concerns in terms of the, the scheme, in terms of the quality of cattle. And I think we know there's more dairy beef cattle coming into the system. Joe has said 40,000 extra cattle so far killed uh, this year. But if you, if you actually factor it in, if you look at the steers uh, killed in 2014 and compare them to this year, coming solely from the suckler herd, they've actually increased in carcass by over six kilos. So 386.5 versus 380 back in 2014. So breeding has a role and you can see the, 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 the effect of the scheme starting to kick in for the herds that are participating in the Beef Data Genomics Programme. Edmund, can I bring you in on that, on the potential of breeding to, to alleviate the situation for the suckler, concerns for suckler farmers at the moment? What's your take on that? Well, I'm in marts uh, a few days of the week and the quality of the suckler herd, the weanlands in the marts, is deplorable at the minute and I'm trying to source good quality weanlands for further feeding and they're just not there. Uh, the quality has dropped and there are no good quality animals there. Like, and as I say, the grades, they might have achieved something by having better calving intervals and all that, but the quality is going down and people are taking less money. Like, there's suckler weanlings there maybe making 200 euros less than they would have been two years ago when men were being breeding better quality weanlings. So I can't see how it's doing any good in the long run. Jackie, do you have a view on the breeding, on potential of breeding to improve the situation? Look, Anton, you know, Anton is, you know, that can improve productivity on the farm is good. And, you know, but a farmer can do everything inside the farm gate to, to improve the situation. But at the end of the day, if the sales price is wrong, it's not, it's not going to make the, his enterprise viable. So definitely, you know, everything has a part to play. But, you know, no matter, and, you know, we can, we can argue about the beef genomic scheme here, but, like, the, the reality is even the top class operators are relying on a single farm payment to keep bread on the table. They're making no money out of their beef enterprises. That's a situation that isn't going to continue long term. We have Brexit coming as a challenge to us. We have also the single farm payment under threat as well, the ag budget under serious, serious pressure. So people are making decisions. And I have beef men coming to me that's saying, you know, I'm fed up with this now for a game of soldiers. I've stayed at it, expecting the, uh, you know, the thing to turn around. You know, I'm not going to stay at it anymore. And like, if we're going to preserve our beef herd, you know, people have to see that there's, you know, a light at the end of the tunnel and that they're going to be able to make an economic return. Joe, as you mentioned, we have seen an increase in dairy bread stock coming through. Do you anticipate that that will continue and what kind of impact will it have? Yes, Claire. Um, while we have seen a reduction in the suckler herd, unfortunately, and uh, even this year it has been more dramatic because of some of the impacts of what we've heard there that at farm level incomes have been taken a hit. Um, at whether at factory level um, prices may have maintained in comparison to last year's levels um, at, at uh, mark level 
average prices have fallen um, and a lot of suckler farmers would be reliant on the mart as an outlet to sell weanlands to sell store cattle. Um, definitely this year we've seen that continued increase in uh, dairy bred stock coming through and not all of them are pure dairy bred cattle, be the Frisians or, or, or Frisian crosses with another dairy breed. A lot of these are Angus crosses, Hereford crosses. Those numbers of cattle have become, you know, significantly higher in recent years. In fact, are up by, by probably 50% over the last four or five years. And those cattle are eligible then for bonuses through breed producer groups, uh, be they Angus or Herefords or even Shorthorns as well too, even though they're coming from a dairy background. They are lighter carcass weights, and there is also a challenge there for finishers with those types of animals because they tend to be of poorer conformation. Um, that you know they don't just need, they don't just meet the requirements of those bonuses uh, just on the basis of having a particular breed code. They still have to meet an O equals in conformation at a minimum, and uh, that is a challenge. Um, particularly not just their genetics, but you know you do need to have good grassland management, good nutrition as well too, too for those animals, select them at the right stage as well too when they're finished. Uh, it's not that simple now to have all your animals qualifying and in most cases a percentage of them will fall off and, and won't meet the requirements and that unfortunately uh, has a, a negative impact then on the price that missing the bonuses, that could be a lot of the margin, could be a lot of the profit involved in some of these enterprises. Edmund, what's your view on the increase in dairy bread stock and the impact it's having, and the impact that you're seeing among your members? Yeah, well, it's having a big impact because, well, last year there was quite a wee bit of um, live shipping, which is very good for taking those lesser quality animals out of the country. This year we've seen that has come to a standstill. So there's going to be a surplus stock now coming in next year which will be going to the factories and once the factory have those lesser quality animals on their books they know they're going to get them then it'll take down the price of beef and the price of better quality animals will fall too so it will have a negative impact on the whole beef sector so it will jackie what's what's the way around that well, you know, we're going to increase the numbers coming out of the coming out of the um, dairy herd. That's a fact. I think six semen has a part to play um, going forward. That you know we can that um, this, what you don't want for replacements that they can be put to a, to a beef to a beef sire, and that that will help. Um, you know, but the difference at the moment between being an O minus and no equals as regards returns, I think there's absolutely no justification with that. If you go back and examine cull cow prices um, through through the early summer. Like cull cows, Frisian cull cows were making as much in June as what Frisian steers are now, or what a, what, a, what an old grade steer is making now, and we're making more. Like it shows, like the factories. I think we have to examine the returns the factories are getting from the marketplace, and there has to be transparency there. Like manufacturing beef, um, you know, the cow beef that they've been selling, they've been getting a very good return for that. We're not getting that return at the moment for steers. Questions have to be asked, and I think the processors at the moment are getting away far too lightly. And um, the returns that are there have to be far more transparent and we have to get a fair price for the projects we're producing. Do you think that the proposed legislation that's being brought through in Europe on unfair trading practices, will, do you have any confidence in that, that that will? Well, I'm hearing about, you know, um, the unfair trading for a long, long time. And I'm also hearing about covering the power of the retailers, the major retailers. You know, I'm afraid I'm gone skeptical and now I'm around a while and I'm gone, I'm gone skeptical when it happen. Like, we were in some of the retailer stands there this morning. You know, they, they have their lovely displays of food. You know, we're, we're, we're promoting the primary producer. But at the end of the day, what the primary producer is getting for the product, whatever it is, whatever food product it is, whether it is beef, dairy, whatever, that what he's getting for that is shrinking and shrinking. And like, what the consumer is spending on food has, has dropped by 50% over the last 10 to 15 years. And I think that's the message that's going to have to be got across. Food is going to have to get dearer if the primary producer is going to stay in business. And that's the reality of life. And consumers are spending less and less on food of their disposable income. And that's a situation that's not tenable going forward. But how do you turn that around? Well, it will turn around eventually because the, the supply of food will get scarce, people will go out of business. And unfortunately, supply and demand is what causes that. 
but hopefully we don't get to that and there's a recognition that you can keep squeezing and squeezing the primary producer. Like we've seen it in the mushroom sector, we see it in the pig sector, we see in so many sectors the squeeze, 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 and numbers of producers dropping dramatically. You know, there comes a point of, of no return where, you know, that, that's just not sustainable going forward. And beef is getting into that situation. Like beef men are asking themselves the question, should I lease my land now or should I stay farming? And that is happening in a lot of situations. And the supply will drop. And what we have, a valuable industry to our economy that we have, won't have the raw material that wants going forward. Joe, we're just six months out now from, from Brexit, from um, a decision on, on what the withdrawal agreement's going to look like. Um, there's a lot of worry out there, particularly on the beef side, about what's going to happen. Where is that 50% of our exports going to go? Um, what do you make of where we're at at the moment, and are you confident that we will find a home for that beef? Yeah, Claire, we certainly would be concerned about the lack of clarity there for farmers, and this is definitely contributing to some of the lack of confidence, particularly around the lighter cattle, those longer-term cattle in the marts. Farmers are a bit wary of buying those animals, and you know it's going to be in a post-Brexit situation when they go to to finish those animals, go to slaughter those animals. You know there's a lot of uncertainty there. Uh, the UK beef market it's taken over 280,000 tons of Irish beef, as you said, Claire, is 50% of our exports. There isn't another market there equivalent to the UK, either within Europe or outside of Europe, that would return to us the same prices that we get out of this, out of the UK, the same value for the products that we send there. Um, so obviously the nearest scenario to what we have at the moment is the best one from Borbia and the Irish beef industry's perspective, the whole sector's perspective. And the customers that we are continuously in communication with, that's their perspective as well too, that you know, Irish beef really meets their requirements in terms of, you know, the majority of these would only stock British beef and Irish beef. There, you know, any of those supermarket customers that we have, Tesco, Asda and Sainsbury's, who are in a proposed merger at the moment. And again, I can, uh, I can, you know, relate to some of the issues as well too, that Jackie raised there as well too, around the power of retailers. These retailers, they're getting bigger and bigger. In the case of the UK, those three big re retailers collectively make up 50% of the market over there. Um, but they do stock Irish beef. They put it on the shelf alongside British beef. They don't buy Polish beef or they don't buy South American beef. And that is, again, the messages that are coming back from those customers are that they're going to continue to value Irish beef, that th that's the situation that they want. Again, they don't want tariffs. They don't want customs borders or anything like that. So all of those political negotiations still have to take place. Um, but we would be confident that, you know, if we're given any kind of a fair deal at all, that we'll be able to continue to maintain our strong share of that market. We're putting of the overall imports of beef into the UK market, Irish beef makes up 70%. We're able to supply it fresh. Uh, we're able to supply quality assured beef. And, you know, for example, for four quarter beef, the freshness of it is very, very important in order to mince it or to make a fresh burger product, for example. Um, they can't do that with beef that has to travel around the world or even travel from the far side of Europe, for example. Jackie, are you confident that we'll find a home for that 50% of our beef exports? And what about on cap reform? Do you think that as we have more autonomy on that now, does there need to be greater supports brought in? I know you're looking for the suckler payment, but is there is there anything else that you think can be done? What about an early suckler premium? Do you think there needs to be increased direct payments for the beef sector? I think, you know, Brexit at the moment has taken the focus off of the cap negotiations completely. And, you know, I was in Brussels there, there in July and the food security and the importance of food for the European Union has slipped down the pecking order. Um, you know, um, defence, immigration are now gone higher, are, are gone above food security. That was never the way before. Food security, the cap, was always the greater part of the budget spend. We have a battle there to maintain our percentage of the budget. But mind that we won't have a reduced budget. We'll have a serious battle to hold our percentage of it. So I think the first battle we have to win is to get the money into the cap. And that's not going to be a simple battle. And I think, you know, Brexit has taken the focus completely off of that. You know, Brexit, you're talking about the imponderables. The UK always wanted to supply of food and then wanted to supply of, of food as cheaply as possible. That's what they always wanted. 
Um, you know, Joe has made very good points there about, you know, they want fresh, they'll want fresh, they'll want fresh beef. I think a deal has to be worked out that we have access to that market. I think the UK will want that. I don't think how we can have a scenario where we're denied access to the UK market. I think it would be a nightmare scenario for us. It would be a real Armageddon. If we have 50% of our beef looking for a new home, we won't be here talking about whether there's 200 euros for the sucked cow because our industry will be, will be, to be terminal, it will be over. So we have to maintain access to that market, whatever. And as Joe said, the retailers in the UK don't want tariffs. They want to sell the beef as cheaply as they possibly can. Now, you can talk, you know, we talk about global warming and the global warming. Are they talking about they're going to go to South America and bring all their beef from South America across to Europe? Is that really for benefit of climate change and global warming and all the targets we have to meet as countries? Even if the UK leave, they still have commitments to the, you know, to the world community as regards climate change and all the rest. So I think, you know, I can see a scenario where there'll be a, a guillotine on us getting into the UK market. I don't think the UK will want it, and I don't think we just we just can't. I just can't envisage that doomsday scenario because that's what it would be to be doomsday for us. That's all we have time for. I'm afraid. Thank you very much for joining us.